Hey everyone, this week we're going to be talking about the FFT or the Fast Fourier Transform in lab. And I know the first time I saw the FFT, I was really confused. There's all these frequencies and magnitudes and sine waves, and I didn't know what was going on. But I'm hoping to show you a couple examples that will help make it more clear what the FFT does. And it's extremely useful, it definitely comes in handy all the time, so it's a good tool to understand. Let's take a look at a quick example that I think is helpful for understanding what it is that the FFT does. So again, the Fast Fourier Transform is all about figuring out what frequency components exist in our signal. So let's take this imaginary example first. So I've generated two sine waves here. I have a sine wave with an amplitude of 2 and a frequency of 20 hertz, and another sine wave with an amplitude of 1 and a frequency of 40 hertz. And I could have picked any amplitudes and frequencies here. It doesn't really matter. But what I did is I took these two sine waves and added them together to get the third sine wave that you see down here. And then I performed the FFT on this sine wave, and this was the result I got. So this is kind of a typical starting FFT. You can see I have one spike with a magnitude of 2 at 20 hertz, which comes from this top sine wave, and another spike down here with a magnitude of 1 at 40 hertz. Now in class we'll talk about details, you know, such as why you might not get a magnitude of 2 if you don't take the FFT correctly, you know, for 20 hertz here, or you might not get the correct magnitudes up at 40 hertz. But I think this is a good beginning example because it shows very clearly that you have a spike at 20 hertz, magnitude of 2, and a spike at 40 hertz with a magnitude of 1. So if I didn't know what signals were in my final signal, I could look at the FFT and I would kind of have in my mind that, okay, I've got this top sine wave in there and I've also got the second sine wave here. So now let's see how the FFT might be used on a real measurement. You remember before with the RC car we had all that extra noise that showed up on our accelerometer signal? I want to see if I can use the FFT to help me figure out where that noise is coming from. So I have one theory that a lot of that noise comes from vibrations that are caused by imbalances in the wheels. And as the wheels spin faster, it creates vibrations in the car which show up on the accelerometer. So to test this theory, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to figure out how fast the wheels are spinning, then I'm going to use that rotational speed to predict what frequency of vibration would show up on the accelerometer. And if those two match, I'm going to feel pretty confident that I've got a solution to my problem. The first thing I need to do is to figure out how fast these wheels are actually spinning. And to do this, I put a piece of tape on one of the wheels to reflect light, and I'm using this optical tachometer that you'll use later on to figure out the speed. You can see it's about 1,770 RPMs, so if you divide that by 60 to convert to hertz, you get about 29.5 hertz. If you remember the statistics video, I took some data with the RC car sitting on a box, and then I ran the motors, and this is what I got. Now, I basically want to repeat this experiment, but I can't use this data and take the FFT of it. And I'll leave it up to you to figure out why, but I'll give you a hint. I only sampled this data here at around 30 hertz, and the signal I'm looking for is about 29 and a half hertz. So that's your hint for why I can't use this data. But suffice it to say, I want to take this data at a higher rate now. Here's a picture of my new experimental setup. The only difference from what I did before is that I'm going to use our data acquisition system from the lab because it could sample a lot faster. And I'm just again going to be sampling the lateral and longitudinal acceleration on this car and I'm going to sample it at 32,000 hertz and I'm going to sample for half a second. So here's the data that I collected running my experiment again and you can see there's definitely a very strong periodic signal in my acceleration plot up here. And if you look at this acceleration plot, it's possible that I could find the frequency of this signal by looking at the period between two peaks here. But these peaks aren't very well defined like they are on a regular sine wave, so it's probably not going to work out too well. And that's somewhat tedious, whereas if I just run the FFT, this is what I get. And again, this amplitude plot here is showing me at a bunch of different frequencies what amplitude is present in the signal. You can see that there's a really big spike down here, and if I come up in MATLAB and click on the data cursor, and then click on that peak, I get 29.3 hertz. Now remember from my measurement of the wheel speed, I was expecting a frequency of about 29.5 hertz if this variation here was caused by a vibration from the imbalance in the wheels. And I'm getting 29.3 hertz, so that's extremely close. I'm calling that confirmation of my hypothesis that this signal is caused by vibrations from the wheels. I could confirm this right by running the experiment again, running the motor at half speed, and see if I still get a peak around, uh, you know, whatever the new speed of the wheels is. So I've got a couple of questions for you based on the experiment I just did. 
Remember in this plot we had the first sine wave with a magnitude of 2 and the second one with a magnitude of 1, and that's exactly what we got in our FFT. In this data, on the other hand, though, it looks up here like we've got a magnitude of maybe 0.3 or 0.2, but down in my FFT, that frequency looks like it only has a magnitude of 0.15. What's going on there? Here's my second question. When this wheel gets up to speed, it looks like the white mark from the tape is moving really slowly, even though the wheel itself is moving quickly. Why do you think that is?